आई वी एम द इनहेरिटेज पॉडकास्ट सीरीज बाय ब्लूमबर्ग क्विंट I am Sonu Bhaseen and you're listening to The Inheritors a podcast series that covers all aspects of family businesses. Today I'm in conversation with Smita Bajoria the founder and head of Heritage Insurance Brokers Private Limited. This is an insurance and reinsurance services company and Smita is amongst a handful of women not only in India but across the world that are part of this very specialized business. Besides this, Smita runs an art gallery in Calcutta and she is also the council general of Denmark for Eastern India. To hear more about her very interesting life story, let's go right across to Calcutta and catch Smita in her beautiful green garden and have a conversation with her. Hi Smita, thank you so much for taking time out on this wonderful yeah. morning. and uh, talking to all of us and sharing your life story and your interesting journey thank you thank you sonu and thank you so your colleagues uh, it's lovely to be on um, in a conversation with you and uh, i hope that um, i'll be able to uh, sort of share and and sort of w- what my journey has been it could be interesting to discuss this with you yeah and what a journey it's been smita um you are part of a business family now and you have your own independent identity which is really uh, not the norm in uh, business families and especially marwadi business families so how can you just share with us about how how you how you've done this uh, uh, carving out of a of a business niche for yourself Yeah so actually i think my first work experience was when my husband was running a jute mill and i started running a farm and uh, because there was a lot of land and i got interested in growing uh, organic vegetables but the ones which were really liked by people but not really available or grown here so that gave me a lot of experience on how to deal with people how to deal with five star hotels how to deal with clients when they were having large scale weddings and what they wanted so that really was my first stepping stone to doing commerce and doing business and uh, how to sort of send the supplies how to phase out the growing that really gave me a lot of insight as to what people wanted and then i sort of stuck to uh, I, i moved out of that area of farming because my husband sold the jute mill and uh, there was no other land where i could cultivate and i began um the insurance broking business and there also it was more people's interaction finding out uh what the areas were we i've worked on very large projects like the ongcs onshore and offshore uh, insurance programs for the petrochemicals and a lot of nuclear power plants and all and it it was in two ways i will first describe that professionally it was very challenging because not many women are in reinsurance worldwide not only in india so it was challenging it's partly technical partly legal insurance this technical is when you go through a uh, plants insurance requirements you know usually they have engineers or people to find out what is really required and then it's partly legal because the insurance document is a legal document it's a legally binding document so it, there was a steep learning curve but i think the people were very forthcoming the family was very forthcoming they were very encouraging and the professionals i dealt with in the insurance uh, companies or in the individual client companies were also very encouraging and forthcoming and they were always trying to help and the family was rallying behind me my mother in law my husband father in law everybody was rallying behind me because it necessitated that i travel to destinations which were outside of india sometimes to places which were not really the trodden path for you know where we had been to israel to bangladesh i'm talking about 15 18 years ago so there was a bit of uncertainty as to where i was going but there were not really many questions asked i mean there were only words of encouragement so which is uh, which is actually quite fantastic because in all my conversations especially with women uh, from family businesses they've always said that you know we wa- we wanted to do things we wanted to do something on our own but our family did not uh, 
support us or we we wanted to do it so i always got the feeling that women kind of wait to be told to do something or they wait for somebody to handhold them um and they get discouraged when they run into their first uh, uh, first questions or first uh, dis- you know some some uh, discouragement from the family how did you manage to win the family over um yeah i think uh, i was a bit of a rebel because i was horse riding before i was riding at a national level so that was a bit of a a uh, rebellious act because it was really is a bit of a dangerous sport for the family but my mother's side um, on my parents side they were very encouraging because i was doing all sorts of sports and we were brought up <clears throat> my brother and i to be equal there were no there were no negative compromises i had to make i mean it was only very positive so when i got married i felt the same way i never felt that i was in any way um not incapable or less capable than any other male member in my husband's family and uh, not having a lot of capital the reason why i went into the service industry because you require far less capital than a manufacturing uh, company or a, a business to run which entails a lot of capital deployment so i naturally chose the route of the service company um using more uh, sort of uh, you know actively the service part rather than the capital part and i must say that uh, you know there was no discouragement at all and i think that the the fact i think what really was positive was they realized that i was serious about the work i was sort of going at it or that people were also taking me seriously the insurance companies or the clients were taking me seriously offering the business and i got business at the right time uh so there was no really resistance for me to not work um because i never sort of they realized that i was serious and i could possibly not take no for an answer yeah um, so, so what maybe the, both the combinations of the combinations of these three factors yeah so which really so what i'm actually hearing uh, you uh, and my what i'm hearing you say is that uh, it is actually up to the women to decide what they want to do and then uh, and then you know start a process of uh, uh, negotiation with the family and to to tell them that they are indeed serious and this is not something that they want to do as time pass or uh, uh, you know just as something that they want to uh, tell the world that they are doing so uh, so how can actually women prepare themselves to start this process of uh, negotiation with the family I think there has to be mutual trust. There has to be a mutual understanding and trust. The family members uh, sometimes feel that you know, if the daughter-in-law goes out, they will not be giving time to the family or to their children. Uh, so there has to be a deep understanding where we have to, you know, they have to get that feeling that yes, we are there all the time, physically, even if I'm not in the house for that seven, eight hours or nine hours. I'm still there when the family needs. I'm there for somebody when they're sick or when there is something in the house. On a day-to-day basis, I'm taking care of the the staff or the kitchen or you know, you know, literally the day-to-day matters. One has to plan and take care of. And even like when somebody is sick or ill or there's a family function. So I think if one and the children are not neglected, the husband doesn't feel neglected. So there is a bit of planning, which. needs to be done and the family needs to be i think the family automatically will see it within a few days that yes the daughter in law is there when i need her she's sitting with me she's talking to me so it is a sort of an adjustment which has to be um made and that it, it's not that if i'm sitting at home the whole day i love my in laws or my kids more than i am there for some shorter period of time so that once that is understood i think by the family and if that is a feeling which they able to convey i i don't think there's much of a problem you know yeah and as as you know of what you've described as a a a, a woman in family <coughs> business is actually the same that applies to women who are uh, working who are employers i mean they have to yeah. they have to they have to uh, they have it's a constant process of 
building trust, building uh, 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 a process of negotiation where uh, they also have to, you know, create their own identity both in the office and as in the uh, in the in the family. But having yeah. been a, a part of a business and running your own business over the last uh, many years, I'm sure that yeah. you've had some interesting experiences when you've gone out and uh, people have reacted to you either positively or negatively. Would you like to share any with the listeners? So I'll tell you about an incident. I mean, this was, this was about uh, nearly 14 years ago. And I was a broker for ONGC for the large installation. And in 2005, uh, in Bombay, there was this massive uh, flooding incident. And um, the, one of the ONGC platforms uh, had a massive fire because a large supply vessel of theirs collided with the platform. And the whole supply vessel was destroyed. And a large part of the platform was destroyed. And uh, the loss was about 1,500 crores. And because Bombay was flooded, <clears throat> because Bombay was so badly flooded, uh, nobody could access the ONGC office or the United office. And so the chairman of ONGC was in constant touch on the phone and said, Sita, what are you going to do about it? So I said, I was speaking to my overseas associates and I said, don't worry, within 40 days we'll give you the first cash call of 700. And uh, he, I don't know whether he believed it or not, but to cut a long story short, within 40 days, the people I was working with, the reinsurers abroad, were ready with the check of 700 crores. So he was so overwhelmed. He had a reception in Bombay and he said, I'm going to make an occasion out of this. And so all the reinsurers, about five, six of them were invited, all men. The United India Insurance, which is a Chennai-based insurance company, their chairman and the board of directors were invited. ONGC stock officials and some other government officials were invited. So this was to be a formal check-giving uh, ceremony for the laws. And um, I think that Mr. Raha, who was a then chairman, could not believe that such a thing would have happened. And everybody sort of uh, gave speeches all around. And towards the end, he said, Smita, come here. And I was sitting, standing next to him and he pulled out two cigars. <laughs> And he said, uh, this, this cigar is for the only man in the room. So he said, you have to light this up now. And he lit up the other one. And, you know, there were like 70, 60, 70 men in the room. So, wow. I mean, that is, is, a, is, I mean, he was, of course, a very sort of different kind of person. But that was really a, a, a moment which I cherished because, I mean, everybody recognized me, whether it was the international reinsurers or whether it was the government here, whether it was the United or OHGC. I mean, I got a standing applause that day and, you know, this acknowledgement was something which was quite, uh, for me, a big thing. Yeah. Um, so usually people would, you know, people may turn around and say, okay, she comes from a business family, she's not, you know, she's not serious about her business, but... This was a true recognition, you know, in many, many ways. Yeah, uh, I, and I do think that giving you the cigar uh, could yeah. not have put it better. And I, I find it, uh, I find it uh, really, really interesting that he did that. But you just said that, you know, uh, coming from a business family, she could have, she, she couldn't have done this. So, do you, in your opinion, do do women from business families suffer from this? burden that they are not taken for their initially they're not taken for what intellect or what skills they bring on to the table or the business but it's thought ki are uske husband ka business hai uske father ka business hai isliye she is also being part of it in your opinion does it happen have you seen it happen with others see the word <clears throat> The universe is very wide and, you know, there are people, there are people out there, both men and women, who who live with their own experience and then they judge people with their own their own experience of their own life. And not only men, I think women also who have not, who don't want to seriously take up a career and want to make a show of it, will sometimes posture and say that, no, she's not serious, she's just doing it for the heck of it. And so will men. But uh, it, you can wonder why I feel that I did sometimes hear some comments, but when I, when I when one goes about one's work seriously, I think people do respect uh, uh, the individual, whether it's a man or a woman, then it really doesn't matter. 
And uh, initially, when I started the company, people thought that, no, she, I will sort of stop working after a few months. But then I was able to attract in the company a lot of talent from the insurance industry to handle these accounts like ONGC and the nuclear power plants. So initially, there may have been some resistance from the community and from the professionals. But then they rally around you. And I think there have been many instances where people have sort of said that, oh, um, she's working very hard and they go the extra mile to even sort of uh, give work and to sort of involve the involve me more in the work than they than normally they would have ever thought. So yeah. I think that once people know you're serious, people really rally behind you, not only the family, but even like this is a this was an industry which was not privatized at that time. It was this just the four insurance companies. But then once they realized that I was getting a job done, they were involving me and they were sort of asking for sort of quotations or whatever the case may be, what was required at that time. Yeah. And in your team, uh, do you have a lot of women or do you, uh, do you have uh, a large number of men? And what is your leadership style? And would you say that it, uh, uh, it differs from, say, your husband's? Um, see, my husband runs a manufacturing company, you know, so it's quite different. I think that he needs to delve into these meetings and he needs to talk to his people much more occasionally because there is a set hierarchy of the person in the factory that is somebody who is they're reporting to. So in a manufacturing company, I think far set, but in a <clears throat> service company, it's a very evolving sort of situation in a service company because the, the world is my universe. When I'm trying to tap a client, it could be a a bank's employees, it could be a pharmaceutical company, it could be a, a company like ONGC. So that is has to be constant. <clears throat> I'm having to constantly be in touch with uh, my people. So it's fla- far more flat in terms of how I run it. So I'm talking to different uh, people in my organization at different times, depending on what we need to target. Like suppose if I'm trying to target some business in Bangladesh, Recently, we're trying to target a business in Ivory Coast. So at any time, the different people have different contacts in the company. So we work in a very flat way. And anybody can walk up to me and say, this opportunity is there. Should we go for it? Or if I hear of something, I have to sort of discuss with my colleagues and say, look, um, you know, some, some Indian client is building a transmission, path, a transmission line in the Ivory Coast or in Sri Lanka. And I think this is what we should try and do to target it. So it's far more flatter, it's far more uh, less structured, I would say, you know. Yeah. And um, so it's um, different to what my husband runs. I think because of the sheer uh, sort of... The, the nature the business, of the business. The style is differing based on the business that the each of us is running, actually. Yeah. Or each of us is engaged in. Yeah, right. So a lot of uh, times I've heard that... Uh, On the dining table, the children grow up hearing their father talk. Largely, it's their father's talk about the business. But here in your household, your children would have grown up uh, listening to both their mother and father uh, talk about business, if any. And uh, is, is there anything that you would say that your husband would have... Uh, learned from you? I mean, learned is a very strong word, but is there, yeah, is there yeah. anything that he would have said, yeah, Smita, you seem to be doing this. Maybe I should try it at my workplace. Has your husband uh, learned anything or has he ever said, Smita, you seem to be doing this well and let me, uh, let me, let me do this by my, let me try and do this. Okay, so what he probably admires are my PR skills because in a service industry, you really have to reach out to many more people in, you know, in different companies, in different environments, in different countries. So I think he admires my PR skills. I don't know whether he wants to invite those because he probably doesn't need it in his industry, but he admires that. And he uh, he admires the fact that if he gives me a job, he knows I'll get to the bottom of it. You know, I try and understand the business and work the business from a point of knowledge and understanding, like he's given me the entire family office to run, um, all the 
all the money that he gets from dividends and all the money that is belongs to him and me and he says that over six six years i think the you've done a good job so he uh he's a very thorough person you know so in fact i have learned more from him uh you know that you when you plan a business you must put it to paper first the plan you must uh, sort of you know visualize or try and think in your mind the different scenarios you must uh, you know if make small mistakes but then eventually when you do something it should be with conviction and with research and with knowledge so i think that's the things which i have picked up which are more important for business yeah he probably has picked up the fact that i have good pr skills i keep up with people all that once i get a job i sort of would not leave it to just chance or hear say or listen to people but take a decision with some amount of research and conviction having read about it or learnt about it yeah so uh, you know through our conversations earlier uh, you yeah. have mentioned that you are now, that you you know this the reinsurance and the family office is not the only uh, work that you do you run yeah. an art, art gallery you are the honorary counsel for uh, uh, the the country of denmark, denmark. so uh, do tell me how did all these other things come about and what is it that you do as part of the council and as as and how do you what kind of an art gallery what kind of uh, uh, patronage do you provide so okay so that i will tell you about this but i'll also tell you about a new digital health offering venture which uh, i'm embarking and which will be launching in june yeah so the gallery came about because uh, i used when i got married and i i was very young when i got married i'm only 18 so i was keen to learn about art and so i used to visit very few there were only two or three galleries in calcutta I used to visit art and then a very good friend said why don't you you know you have some spare time so why don't you learn how to paint so those days uh, there was a ex teacher of uh, one of the government art colleges and he would come once a week and teach me how to paint um, <clears throat> hoping that i might take it up as a full time vocation but i learned through that i learned about the various techniques of painting whether it's oil painting or whether it's watercolor or acrylic and then I, whenever there was a nice exhibition in town he i would i would tell him so why don't you take me to the gallery and explain the nuances of art you know how do you understand it how do you read a painting what is there because my eyes were very untrained i was very young 18 or 19 and so we would go to this gallery together and learn and as a result of that i was very fortunate to start a collection of art when i was very young so i have this very very good collection of bengal art which is um, quite a precious one because it has a lot of artists of those era who become now very very popular so and then i realized about 15, 12 years ago that you know i've received a lot from art it's sort of broadened my horizon it sort of puts you in touch with a lot of artists who come from different walks of life and also it shows the struggles of their life the painting depicts the struggles like a lot of art if i've seen in the delhi art fair talks about the, the issues in kashmir or it talks about day to day issues or it talks about gender issues so it sort of enriches my life the art enriches my life because in a social strata where everybody is equal and everybody has a lot of everything then you sometimes don't on a daily to day basis come in touch with people who are talking about these issues through their art so i i think i'm very fortunate to be able to not only to be exposed to this art but also on a day to day basis meet these artists because on real terms and they are talking about what are the issues and how they are expressing it and how they are trying to bridge the gender gap or the financial gap or whatever it may be so it has enriched my life so i thought i must start a gallery I always wanted to but it was only due to lack of <clears throat> time that I could not and then I said if I don't do it now I will never be able to do it so basically we started the gallery in 2007 and the idea was to in, uh, showcase younger artists who don't find a platform all the time so talented artists we've shown art from Nepal we've shown art from Iran we've shown art from Denmark from all over the world and also of course a lot of art from india everything so it's the, the i as i tell the artists the gallery is your stage i mean you use this stage or you use this area as your own if you propose a pro, if you propose a good 
show sure, I'll be very happy to post the show so it's like a giving back to the artist it's like a giving back to the society because it's helped me to enrich my life in the last 30 years art has enriched my life so that's the way i look at the gallery and we've done some fabulous shows at the gallery and i think it continues to enrich my life because every time i do a show there's something to learn from that show yeah and do you still continue to paint smita I don't continue to paint, but as a promise to myself, I continue to visit art galleries and museums <laughs> wherever I am. Because painting, painting, horse riding, like I used to do all this, takes up a lot of time. Like I used to do competitive horse riding when I was very really much younger. But each of these activities takes up three, four hours of time, you know, because you need to do it. Yeah. If I am not doing something well, I am not satisfied. It's like you, Sonu. I mean, you are a very gifted individual. You write books, but unless you do something well, I suppose you don't get that satisfaction. So you need to really take time to do something, which I feel I am not able to do at this stage. You know. Yeah. So hopefully there will be one day when you will. And for me, uh, you know, one simple message to all the women who want to do things later in life is to uh, is. get into some competitive sport when you're young because it develops that spirit of competitiveness and the fact that you know I can do it and then uh, so te- yeah so then moving on to this uh, uh, Denmark counselor thing this sounds very interesting yeah. so uh, are you a diplomat yeah i'm an honorary diplomat if you read the vienna convention there is a provision for career diplomats in the vienna convention act and there is a provision for honorary diplomats so we very much uh, fulfill the same functions we have the same activities uh, <clears throat> earlier i would issue visas for denmark or for the schengen earlier but now it's all been sort of collated through bfs so the whole schengen because it's sort of a visa from Den- uh, for denmark would also be applicable for travel within italy or any of the schengen states so they have sort of now collated it so the activities are uh, sort of uh, trade you have to help to promote the trade in the country If if the individual company or the Danish company, like recently a Danish cosmetic company wanted to collaborate with a Indian uh, small FMCG company for distribution, and that you know you have to facilitate it in any way, talk to the embassy, talk to them, and you know facilitate whatever they need, either speeding up the license, helping them, or putting in a word. So then there are other functions where people adopt children, and we I issue a temporary passport for these children to. Travel out, so the passport may be valid for seven to ten days till they reach Denmark. It could be legal. The companies need a lawyer because they've gone into some dispute or there's a divorce case or something. So you recommend doctors. It could be the, that they need lawyers or doctors. Or, you know, if there's a dispute, a lawyer. Or if they're not well, there have been instances where um, Danish have been caught for some wrongdoing. So one has to negotiate and you know with the police. you know go to the police station make sure that they are defended in court <clears throat> and they are able to leave the country so that they, these are the similar functions which any diplomat who's a career diplomat also has to fulfill yeah and of course then there is a pr where you keep up with the government you know in case uh, government is having a industrial show or is having something and then we also sort of uh, have within each half our cell keep up with the american They are all career diplomats, about thirty career diplomats. But we would meet amongst ourselves and exchange notes and keep up with each other, and all the other honorary diplomats. So it's pretty much in a capsule, same thing what a, a career diplomat does. But obviously the workload is not so much. So you know one can spend maybe like few hours in a week and try and fulfill all the duties. Yeah. So as your husband would say, this is all part of your uh, relationship building and uh, utilizing your relationship building skills and uh, helping others. And uh, yeah. then uh, how th- how then how then this new digital health uh, space? How did this come about? So about fifteen years ago, after the after the um, insurance broking job. I had started a TPA, which is a third-party claim the administrative company with for working for the government for the insurance company. So when they issue a health policy, they would designate a, a claim administrator who would come in and who would administer the claims, issue the ID card, and all. So that that is known as a third-party company, third-party administrative company. It's called a TPA. 
So as a result of the build up over the last 15 years, we now have about 14 million policyholders. And um, every week, almost every week, some friend or somebody would ring me up and say, please, though the process runs smoothly and the claims can be administered, but there is a sort of uh, fear psychosis in people that if I go to the hospital, will I be looked after? Will my claims be settled? So every week almost in spite of the process running smoothly and on its own, I'll get a call once a week to say that, Shrita, can you help with this or that? So, And as I spoke to people, I realized there's a lot of gap in the market. So the TPA is now settled down. It's run professionally. I'm a shareholder of it, but it's run professionally by a person, a uh, very capable CEO. And we have about 22 offices. So I realized that there is a lot of synergy between what the India needed is they needed, apart from insurance, there are a lot of gaps and lacunae in the system where people don't know which doctor to visit. They do not know which physiotherapist is in their area. They, if they want a GP, if there's somebody very sick, they don't know where to call a visiting GP. If, if they don't live here and if, if they are younger people and their parents are living here, <clears throat> they do not know that uh, for every sort of issue, uh, who to consult so that the required medical treatment or the attention is uh, given to their parents. So there's a lot of lacunae and a gap. And also Calcutta is a center of medical excellence for a lot of people because from the northeastern states, from Bangladesh, a lot of people are coming to Calcutta for treatment. And many people, even in very affluent families, really don't know who to go to. So who's a good lung specialist? Who's a good urologist? Who's a good eye specialist. So what we have devised is we are, and we have a connection because of our TPA with about 7,000 hospitals in India the last 15 years. So what we are doing is we are putting all these on a digital platform. We are tying up with eye doctors, we are tying up with dental, ENT, who are not always a part of insurance. And we are giving a sort of, we are, we are offering uh, the customer a, a seamless kind of experience which is outside of insurance. So anybody who wants to consult a GP, they have just, it's app-based and computer-based, so they can get an appointment for a GP through an app. If, say, your, if anybody's parents are living here and they are NRIs, they want that uh, the parents are taken for periodic checkups every three months to the hospital or that the diabetes uh, tests are administered and the results are sent to them every month, then, you know, those are the kind of VIP services which we are offering, you know, so there'll be levels of services and people can opt for different services. We're also having an e-commerce um, area where, you know, pe people can order, you know, medical things like wheelchairs, beds, right. machines, like medical equipment, medicines, right. all through e-commerce, you know. Right. So it can be delivered. If somebody's coming out of hospital, they don't have to run around and see where to find a wheelchair. If they order it online, it will be waiting for them in their house when they reach. Right. Likewise, if anybody requires diabetic medicines or the hypertension medicines, every month, sort of, say on a designated day of each month, the medicines will reach them. Right. So, uh, again, helping people uh, live their lives better is what I understand yeah. uh, this uh, yeah. venture is all about. So, before I end, yeah. Shrita, I want to ask you, um, yeah. your children, having seen yeah. both their parents work in and successfully, whose footsteps yeah. are they following? I think that... Uh, I think they imbibe, as you will know, you have a wonderful son. I think you will you will realize that children imbibe, I think, the points. I mean, the as they see their parents live their life and engage themselves in work, I think the children imbibe, I think, good, good uh, values and good points and uh, their style of working from both parents. I, I, it's very difficult to delineate and say, that these were from my husband or these were from me, but I think that um, the time the kids may not admit it, but I think as they grow up, maybe they realize that they have imbibed through a process of observation or hearing, as you say on the dining table, when we gather around, they sort of tend to pick up yeah. these values. Hmm. I would say values or style of working from both parents. Yeah, so my challenge always has been that, uh, uh, you know, in spite of having spent almost three decades in the corporate world, 
my son always looked upon me more as a mother than as a corporate person and uh, i wonder if uh, you know that has uh, that has you had a similar experience so if i were to ask your son to describe you would you would he first describe you as a uh, as a professional woman who's running a successful business or would he focus on the softer skills of you as a person as a mom no i think he would uh, he would be balanced in his description because i'm very house proud as a person and i used to take him for his horse riding classes or his swimming classes or be present in his school when he didn't do his homework <laughs> so uh, you know i was i was there on the critical times when he needed me to be there or on the good times when he was uh, you know when he was riding and he was in a tournament and he was winning a trophy so i was there but uh, also he he when he's here uh, and he still comes from uk he stays there he knows that just because he's here for five days i won't be able to because of my work engagements i cannot sit for five days i could not sit even then when he had his holidays i could not sit for five ten days at home i could not i cannot even do it now so i think he appreciates the fact that okay but in the afternoon if he had a swimming championship i would come back from office and i would meet him at the club or i would pick him up and take him so i feel that he i think the home and work balance he realizes i've been trying to juggle it and maintain it so i don't think he sees me only as a mother or only as a professional right he's, right i think it's in his mind i'm i'm, I'm thinking it's quite over that i'm playing yeah and i my my overall takeaway after having spent this wonderful conversation times uh, you know in conversation with you is that mm. this uh, myth that you know you have to choose either between family and work is actually a myth uh, people there are ways that uh, women especially women can find a way to do both and 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 give it their best for both so uh, so thank you smita for talking thank you so no it's been really lovely talking to you and uh, i really enjoyed myself in the morning yeah. thank you for asking me i'm really touched thank, thank you. you thank you and uh, i i look forward to having another conversation with you in the near future the inheritors podcast series by bloomberg quint Think fast. If I tell you I'm Parsi, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Dansak, I don't blame you. My name is Pozen Patel. You may know me as the Bavi Bride. Though I run a popular Parsi food blog, the truth is I didn't know anything about Parsi food until I got married. It was just my luck. He turned out to be your typical sadra lega wearing, kawap khari eating Parsi boy. And the only thing I knew was dansak, or rather, how to eat it. But there's more to Parsi food than dansak. And there is more to us than our obsession with eggs and our legendary Rani cafes. Welcome to Not Just Dansak, a fresh new show where I talk to friends, fellow bavas and Parsi entrepreneurs about all things Bhonu, a little bit of history, a dash of bava madness and a lot of food talk. There's more to Parsis than meets the eye and there's certainly more to us than Dansak. Join me every Tuesday as I talk to some of my favorite Parsis in the food space in India and beyond. I am the Bavi Bride and this is not just Dansar.